one of the one of the ways that it's done poorly is by having the you know the inmates run the asylum, which is uh, not done in any other uh. other democracy. The inmates run the asylum. The inmates run the asylum. The inmates run the asylum. In late 1988, Ronald Reagan sat down with David Brinkley for his last interview as president. One of the main subjects is hatred of legislator-led redistricting, or gerrymandering. I think that this is a great conflict of interest. To ask men holding office, elected from districts, to change the lines of that district to fit the new population uh, changes. And uh, they are dealing with the district that elects them. Reagan's fears about legislators manipulating districts to benefit their party is not just a Republican problem. Just last year, President Obama made an implicit jab at GOP gerrymandering during his eulogy for former House Speaker Tom Foley. It's tempting to wonder if we still have room for leaders like Tom, whether the environment, the media, the way the districts are drawn. The second section of the first article of the Constitution charges representatives with changing the boundaries of their districts every 10 years to ostensibly reflect shifting populations. While the letter of the law does not dictate that self-serving redistricting is wrong, Lessig views public distrust as a fundamental aspect of institutional corruption. The suspicion that results from obviously politically motivated redistricting, from every facet of society all the way up to the executive, fits this definition perfectly. But how does gerrymandering look in action? Let's imagine a state with three congressional seats and only 15 voters in each. There are 45 total voters in the state. 25 of the voters are Republican and 20 are Democrats. You might guess that a fair election in such a state would yield maybe two Republican representatives and one Democratic. Now imagine that you can draw the district boundaries in any way you like. The only condition is that you must keep 15 voters in each one. If you were a Republican, you could ensure that three Republican representatives were elected by diluting minority Democratic opinion into districts that are largely Republican. This is called cracking, one of the major forms of gerrymandering. If you were a Democrat, you have the raw mass of voters to secure spots for two Democratic representatives by stuffing an excess of Republican voters into one district, leaving small Democratic majorities in the other two. This is called packing the other major form of gerrymandering. Three primary problems fuel public mistrust of gerrymandering. The first is similar to the issues seen with the arbitrary border drawing that followed colonial rule. Groups with little in common besides political efficacy are grouped together. Contradictory interests, the industrial, the rural, the suburban, are unnecessarily combined to create hodgepodges of districts. Secondly, when the majority redistricts well, it makes incumbency almost inevitable. Nonpartisan voting aggregator FairVote found that in stark contrast to 2010, when the Republicans picked up 63 seats in the House, only 21 races are truly up for grabs in the 2014 election cycle due to extensive GOP redistricting. California is an extreme example of incumbent-friendly redistricting. Only once, in 265 races from 2002 to 2010, did districts representation flip parties. Incumbents held on to all but one seat fought for in congressional elections. Thirdly, the creation of clearly partisan districts encourages extremism in candidates. The polarization of Congress can be partially explained by the fact that most representatives ran in districts where their party's views were highly normalized. The clear strategy is to give redistricting power to individuals not affected by redistricting. In other democracies, like the UK and Australia, there are independent commissions that draw the district boundaries. These independent commissions write the system of incentives and largely depoliticize redistricting decisions. The internet, big data, and open source technology also offer an intuitive and empowering tool against partisan redistricting. Micah Altman, along with collaborator Michael McDonald, has been working on exciting projects that utilize crowdsourcing and collaborative knowledge creation to suggest more logical district boundaries. Uh -huh. We had thousands of plans generated from it. Uh, and compared to, we could find less than, than a dozen plans generated 10, 10 years ago. Their public mapping project, quote, seeks to change the power balance by making it possible for the public to draw the boundaries of their communities and to generate
generate redistricting plans for their state and localities. So to engage in a policy debate in the fullest sense, you've got to be able to formulate alternate proposals. The fact that there's this now very large body of legal redistricting plans means that there's more evidence for the court to consider this. The it doesn't change the political incentives. Right? It makes this sort of self-dealing a little bit more risky. Mm. Proponents of uh, reform uh, can use it as a uh, as one of the, the tools in a functioning commission system. After talking to Dr. Altman, we were left to wonder a couple of things about the efficacy of the open source mapping's challenge to gerrymandering. First, we wondered if people would actually be interested enough in redistricting to spend time with the application. Altman suggested that it's fun and accessible, we still doubt it would be a big draw to the average American. Additionally, even if public individuals or commissions called legislators on questionable redistricting, would there be widespread enough pressure for legislators to change their ways? Despite these limitations, Altman software appears the most democratic and contemporary solution to the problem of congressional control over their own elections. Even if it doesn't completely control the inmates, it certainly has the potential to restore relative order to the asylum.